Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for everyone gathered, everyone listening, Lord, this morning. We just pray that we would be clay in your hands, Lord. You are the potter and we're the clay. So, Lord, encourage us, build us up. Lord, I pray for Pastor Izzy, Lord, that you would speak through him uh, to encourage your people. Lord, we also lift up other churches, Lord, including Calvary Chapel Hilo. Lord, for our brothers and sisters over there, Lord, we just pray for unity and a focus on Jesus. Lord, on this Palm Sunday as we celebrate... Uh, that triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, Lord, for the work that he had at hand, that he was willing and, and able to do, and uh, Lord, that changed the course for all of us. And mm-hmm. we ask this now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, if you grab your Bibles and turn to John 12, if you don't have a Bible, there's some extras on the back table here. Just raise your hand, and we'll be glad to get you one. And we're going to pick up in the middle of the chapter. If you go to John chapter 12, Verse 12, John 12, 12. This will make it easy for you to know where we are. Starting off this morning, the launching of a, of a wonderful topic that I get to do every year. You know, this is, we take a little break from our verse by verse, chapter by chapter, study through the Word of God on Easter and on uh, Palm Sunday, the week before Easter, to honor the Lord and, uh, and what He's done. And this is, a, this is a pretty significant day in all of Christendom because this is the day that Jesus would, you know, all the way up until this point, his, his, own, his own brothers, are, well, technically they're half-brothers because they had, the same, they had the, the, the same mom, but they had a different dad. They had Joseph. Um, Jesus had the Holy Ghost as his father, and Mary was conceived of, uh, by a virgin. And that was the sign God promised. Remember it, when, when the Lord said, Test me, he asked one of the kings. You ask me anything you want. Make as high a sign as in the heavens above or below. Anything you want. And the king was like, I'm not, I don't want to test the Lord. And the Lord goes, okay, I'll pick the sign. And what was the sign he said he would, he would give to the world that they would know it, that God is real? He said, I will make a virgin to be with child. Okay? By the overshadowing. That was the sign God picked as a sign. Now, when you see this happen, this is like a little, Hello? God's at work here, you know, and so Jesus, when he came, that was a big deal when he was being born, you know, the angels announced, here he is, the one, Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Now we come all the way to the, to the time, 33 years later, he has been three years in his public ministry, and all this time leading up, for the, it's three years, in, age 30 is when he started going out into the public and preaching. And his disciples like, well, why don't you just reveal who you are to the world? I mean, you're God with us. And he said, my time has not yet, what? Come. It's not yet, not yet, not yet. All the way up until the, the point where you get to study today. This is the day when he will finally kind of go public. Like, I am the Messiah. But in doing this, does he get like a, a, a real round of applause from from everybody? Or uh, how were the religious guys? Did, how did they receive him on this day? <laughs> he was giving thumbs down, man. They did not like this day. And we're going to see that today when we look into the scripture, that the religious Pharisees and the Sadducees, they did not like him coming in and doing what he was about to do because they understood the scripture. I'm going to have to take you to Psalm 118 to to bring out some things that if you're not a student of the Old Testament, you might not know what's so significant about him coming in uh, on a donkey. And, uh, and we'll have to go to Zechariah 9, just, to, just a quick visit so you know this was prophesied of the Messiah, the one that would come to save us. But see, the Jews, they, they wanted at this time, they were under oppression from the Roman government. And what they wanted was not a savior from their sins, even though the scripture bears forth the idea that there would be a Messiah that comes to take away our sins. They, like the other portions of scripture, said the Messiah will come and establish his rule and his reign and smite down the the, the power of the rulers of this earth and his, his rule would be established. They wanted that guy to show up. 
Because in the Jewish thinking, I don't know if you know this, but in Jewish thinking, they actually believe there are two messiahs. One to die, to die for sin, that lamb that would be slain, you know, like John the Baptist said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They, they were like, we're okay with that. But see, when you're under oppression, you're not really thinking about take, get rid of my sins. You're thinking about get rid of the mean government that's, that's taxing me to death and, and is putting, you know, all these bonds on me and I, I can't stand. Get, free me from this oppression. And they clung hard to the scriptures that taught about the Messiah coming and establishing his kingdom. His kingdom would come to earth. Now, do you think that God is going to bring his kingdom to earth? Does anyone think that, that that's part of the plan? Well, absolutely it is. In fact, Jesus even said, when he, they said, teach us how to pray. And he said, well, pray in this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's the next line? Oh, you good folks are raised like I was Catholic. You can do this one by rote. What's the very next line? Thy kingdom, what? Come, thy will be done where? On earth as it is. In heaven. Yeah. Um, you literally had Jesus teaching to pray that God would send his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. The, the idea that God would establish his kingdom down here and he would rule in righteousness, not, not corrupt politicians running the, the show. Wouldn't it, you know, if, it's a, if we just had a guy who is really like Jesus running the show, wouldn't that be better? You know, and, and so that promise is actually a promise of the scripture that's going to come to pass. But see, in the Jewish understanding, because of the way that the, the you know, well, I'm going to show you today. We don't always understand things of God. In fact, I will prove it to you in this very passage, John chapter 12, that they didn't even understand what was happening, even though it was happening right in front of them before their eyes on that day. So when I read you this passage, I'd like to ask you to do me a little favor. Let's pretend we, are, we get the privilege to take a, a time machine and actually go back and be in the crowd on this day when Jesus gets to ride in on the donkey. We're, we're going to be eyewitnesses. You know, just with your mind's eye, just think, okay, I'm going to read the story, but I'm not just going to read it like, you know, passively, you know, kind of outside of it. I want you to p pick... Like, I'll be one of the guys in the story. I'll, I'll be there. You know, maybe it, uh, Jesus is going to send a couple of disciples to go get the donkey. Maybe you get to be one of those guys or, you know, whatever, whatever part. I want you to actually actively put your brain in the story. Like, I'm, I, I'm there because I want to see if you pick up some things different. If you, really, if you really read the story like that, you might see a whole bunch of new things that you wouldn't, you wouldn't consider. Let me show you this today as we pick up in John chapter 12, verse 12. It says, On the next day a large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and they went out and they met him. And they began to shout, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel, or we say Israel. He said, Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now that's a quote from Zechariah 9.9. 9. The prophet Zechariah said that the king of God, God's choice, would come seated on a baby donkey. And if we look in the other passages of, uh, of Scripture here, we can go over to Luke's Gospel in chapter 19 verse 28 or even to um, Matthew 21 there's um, this this particular day is chronicled for us in, in multiple gospels from the different gospels writers perspective in fact John tells us that Jesus just finding a donkey sat on it now if you read the other gospel account you find out that Jesus sent two of the fellows to go into a to, to, to the town across the way to find this donkey's colt that was that was tied up, he said, and it was a donkey's colt on which no one had ever sat. This is a baby donkey no one's ever ridden. He said, go and take it, and, and, and if they should ask you, what are you doing? Take it, because this is like thievery back then. If you untied someone's donkey, it's it kind of equivalent to um, Grand Theft Auto today. You know, I mean, a donkey was, I mean, think about it. Like a donkey, you know, or a horse, that, a mule, that was your, your way of... It, of transporting goods and transporting yourself, you know, to ride on it. And here, they're going and they're they're stealing this baby donkey 
and taking it away. They get, now, what, I, I've done this study before, so for those of you that were with me when I did it, and we looked over in the, in the sister passage of, of the Gospel of Luke and Matthew, we saw that the two of them were going, you know, two were assigned to go do it. And I always say, who would volunteer to go get the donkey for Jesus on this day? Any, anybody volunteered? If he said, I need someone to go get the donkey, would you be one of the fellows that goes over? In this case, it was two of the fellows of the disciples. I, I just pick, I, in my mind, I picture Peter and John, you know, being picked on. You know, you guys go get the donkey. And I can just see the two of them on the way. Look, you untie it, and if they say anything, I'll say the Lord says he has need of it. No, you untie it, and I'll say, because whoever is the one stealing in, in Middle Eastern culture, what happens to your hand if you're stealing? They cut it off. This is not, <laughs> I'd rather be the guy going, the Lord said we were supposed to get it. But the other guy can have his hand on the leash. You know, you untie it, I'll say it. And they go there, and they, and they untie the donkey, and sure enough, the, guy, the folks come out and go, what are you doing? And they, we don't know which one said it, but one of them said, the Lord said he has need of it. And they said, well, okay. Now that happens all the time, right? You're stealing a car, the Lord has need of it, just okay, take it. Right? I mean, that's kind of the equivalent. And this is why I want to, to put yourself in this story. This is not normal. But yet, Jesus was in control of the whole circumstance. And he said that this day must be fulfilled. Let me read the account in Matthew 21. This is the day that uh, up to this point, not yet my time, not yet my time. This day, it's my time. And it's his time to be revealed in a very special spiritual presentation to the world because this is the day where he will actually, uh, up to this point, never did he let them go Hosanna, which is saved now, King Save. By the way, I mentioned that in our worship time when we sang Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is a cry of salvation. You're crying out, save us now, save us now. But it's not like, hey, I fell down and anyone help me. It's literally a cry to authority in power. Like you're crying out to the, to the king or to the, to the president of the United States. If someone that has the power to save. You're saying, save us as a people. Save us now. And this... This cry that they're crying out in Hebrew is very, well, it's, it's known what he was saying. In fact, it's so well known that the, dis, the, 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 the leaders, look, look what they said. It says here, um, so the people, they were, they were coming to him, and, and the Pharisees, they, they're getting angry. In verse 19, the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you are not doing any good. Look at the whole world has gone after him. The whole crowds are all turning and following him. Now, in Luke's gospel, I love this, in Luke 19, this same day is recorded by Luke for us. And if you look at Luke 19, verse 38, as they cried, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees of the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered them. You guys know this part, right? As I tell you, if these were to remain silent, the very stones, the rocks would cry out. Because this day was prophesied. This day has to happen. I always joke that would be a real rock concert. I mean, the very, there's a lot of rocks in Israel, guys. They got it like we do here in Hawaii, only instead of the black lava, they got this kind of goldish hue um, stone it's a little bit kind of in the sunlight that that's why they call the city of jerusalem the city of gold is because they use this stone that when the sun hits it just right you know from a distance it looks like it's made out of gold it's just that color and so so they had these rocks everywhere jesus goes i tell you the truth if these if these people would to tie their tongue the very rocks would cry out hosanna because this verse that they're crying hosanna in the highest save now be, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is from the psalm, Psalm 118. Now those of you guys that are students of Bible trivia, you know Psalm 117 is the shortest psalm. Psalm 118 is, uh, has a special meaning. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm. So between the shortest psalm and the longest psalm, 
Which, by the way, once we added our New Testament books, it's really interesting. Psalm 118, verse 8, turns out to be the verse that is, has the same number of verses. If you count all the verses of the Bible, from Genesis up to this verse, and then all the verses in the Bible from that verse, Psalm 118, 8, to the end of Revelation, this is the very center verse of the Bible. So, so just for Bible trivia, if you ever get asked, what's the central verse of the whole Bible? Eight, well, Psalm 18, 8, yeah. And if they go, and what is it? You know, because people are like, I wish God would just reveal what his plan is. What is his will for my life? I wish I knew what he wanted. Well, look at Psalm 118, 8, would you? Since this is the psalm they're quoting when they sing Hosanna, I'll show you. It's a little further down from verse 8. This, this one, this, the center of God's word, says, better is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in what? In man. Better to put your trust in the Lord than to trust in man. That's God's, God's central verse of the whole Bible. Better to tr take refuge. That's the, you know, when you take refuge, that's where you seek safety, right? You're, you're, you're fleeing from some, from some danger. You need somewhere safe. The Lord says, I'm that place. Remember Jesus said, anyone, anyone who's weary, heavy laden, come to me and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Refreshment for your soul. Come to me. Now, Psalm 118, if you're a student of the Psalms, you know this is the psalm that is a prophetic psalm, giving thanks to God for his saving goodness. His saving goodness. He has the power to save in this psalm. Save from whatever man might throw at us. Lord is for me, verse 6 says, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me, verse 7, for, uh, for among whom is my help. Therefore, I will look at those on, on those with satisfaction, on those that hate me. Because the Lord, I don't have to worry. Even my enemies come against me. Why don't I worry? Who's for me? The Lord. The Lord is for me and the nations surround me. Yet the Lord is for me. And he goes on, he says in verse 14, the Lord is my strength, my song. He also has become, and we sing this song, by the way, he also has become my salvation. It goes on and says in verse 19, open unto me the gates of righteousness and I will enter in. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. The gate to enter in, he's talking about. This way to come before God. Well, Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me, right? And here in the same psalm, verse 22, a very quoted verse in the New Testament, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the what? The chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Did the religious guys reject Jesus as the Messiah? Yeah. They rejected the chief cornerstone, the one that the whole building was to be built around. They didn't like it. We don't want it. Now this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. What day? The day they rejected Jesus? The leaders would reject him? O Lord, do save, we beseech thee. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity, verse 25. O Lord, blessed is he who comes in your name. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is, is God, and he has given us light. Bind, bind what? The festival sacrifice with cords to the, to the horns of the altar. Why, why would he talk about binding the sacrifice to the altar? On this great day of salvation. Oh, Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because this is the day that's announcing, here comes the Messiah. But Jesus didn't come to set up his kingdom on this visit. And this is the problem with the Jewish understanding that the rabbis had. They thought it was two separate messiahs coming. One savior, one suffering messiah. The suffering one would take care of our sins. The savior one would conquer all the kingdoms of this world for us. The problem is they didn't understand the scripture fully. It's the same guy. He's just coming for two visits. The first time he comes, Jesus says, in reference to our sin. The author of Hebrews tells us and explains it more fully that Christ came 
the first time to, to pay for our sins. But the second time when he returns, not going to be doing nothing about our sins. That's all done. He's hung on the cross. Last three words he said is, it is what? Finished. Finish. That part is done. When he comes again, that's when he'll come in power. And it says he'll come, we read in Revelation, with his myriad upon myriads, the thousands upon thousands of saints coming back as he's flying in on a white horse. When the clouds will be parted and the appeal like a, a trump that will, that, that, that will cry out and it, it will blast. It'll be like a, a, a thunderclap so fast. And as lightning flashes, it says, from east to the west, so shall he return. I always laugh when I say, I'm going to get together with God in a while. You know, I, I, I heard he's coming. I, you know, I, not today, in a while. You know, when I, when I start hearing he's coming, then I'll, then, then I'll repent on that day. I said, you're not going to have time. I mean, you, you'd have to outrun lightning, right? I mean, that's how fast his return. You need to make up your mind to be right with him now. Today is the day of salvation. This is the acceptable day. Get, get right now because you ain't going to even have time. When, it, when that trump blows, it's, we're gone. And I love it today because I know just right behind me, all these clouds are rolling in. And I know if Wally Dolan was here, he'd be like, hey, is, this is a good day. Because it says his coming will be in the clouds. You know, Every time there's a like, really gloomy, cloudy day, Wally would look up there and go, hey, is, guess what? This would be a good day. The Lord could come, to, you know, those clouds just part like a curtain peeled back and here comes the Lord. And you're not going to have time to make up your mind at that point. You have to already be ready. Yeah. Scripture says be dressed in readiness. Be ready. You don't know what hour he's going to come. Be ready. Well, here's his first coming. Here's the big re reveal of his first coming. He has come to be the festival sacrifice bound on the altar. You know, spiritually, Jesus is coming to be the lamb that would be sacrificed for our sin. This prophetic psalm, the Jews knew it. Oh, those religious Pharisees and Sadducees, they knew Psalm 118. That's why they're so upset. They understood the significance spiritually when the people were crying, Save us now, O King. O King, save us. They're saying, You're the King of all kings. You're the Lord of all lords. You come and save us from this oppression. And Jesus actually was coming to save us, but not from the, from the oppression of men, from the oppression of sin. Because the wages of sin is far greater than the, the oppression of men. The wages of sin is what? Death. He goes, we've got to fix the big, big issue first. Let's overcome death first. Then we can deal with the, with the bad guys. Okay? That stuff, that's small potatoes to the Lord. You know, the, the men down here that wave their fists at God, yeah, I'm better than you. <laughs> Listen, buddy, just stand back, please, would you? I don't want to get zots when that lightning hits you. <laughs> you know, you are not bigger than God. Good luck. It's a bad deal. Don't, don't be doing that. But, but this is the psalm that they're crying out from, and the Pharisees, they're like, tell your people to be quiet. Jesus like, doesn't work that way. If, they be, if they'd be quiet, the stones would cry out. This day has to take place. This is the day I came for. And he was the master of the universe. And this day, we see his mastery. We ri literally see Emmanuel, God with us. When, when people say, I wish God... And by the way, if uh, any of you ever had someone approach you and say, I wish God, if he's real, he would just show up and show himself. Like, it would help me so much if he would just really, like, if he's really out there, why doesn't he show up? And you know what the correct answer is, right? That's what we're studying right now. He already did. He, that's a great, and, and there's nothing wrong with that sentiment. You just say, that's a great sentiment. But you might not know the facts. He already did. Jesus did come to this earth to be God with us. And on that day, well, they'll be like, oh, yeah, sure, he's God. How do you know? Well, I know because I read this chapter, and chapter 12 of John tells us a really interesting thing. I read over it on purpose, skipped it, but I'll go back to it now if you don't mind. Let's go back to the two verses before John 12:12 12, 12, to John 12:10. Let me show you something, one of the dynamics of this day that was going on. And those of you that have studied this, you already know the chapter, so it's not a surprise, but, but it is fun to, to see it in context. 
It says here, well, let me back all the way up to verse 9. There was a large crowd of the Jews that had learned that Jesus was there. And they came, it says, not for Jesus' sake only. Really? Well, then what, what were they there for? This is the great festival is happening. They're getting ready for the big Passover feast. You say, well, they're for the Passover. Nope, that's not what it says. Read on. Because John was there. He says, not for Jesus' sake only did they come, but they also came that they could see someone else. His name was Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. They wanted to see this guy who had been in the grave for four days, dead. You say, well, why would they want to see a guy who had been dead for four days that Jesus raised? Oh, come on. If you had a friend that died and they were gone for four days, who would not be one of the ones right behind me going, can we talk? So what was it like? Did you see a light? Was it a tunnel? What was, you know, what was on the other side? I mean, come on, our, our human curiosity would kick in so bad. We'd be like, let's get a hold of that guy. We got to talk to him, right? He's a rock star. He was dead for four days and now he's alive and everybody wants to pee. They, they, they all want to see him. They don't want to talk to him. That, that's totally normal, by the way. The reaction to seeing someone touched by the power of God, resurrected from death, that's a biggie. In fact, it's such a biggie that if you back up and you read the, the whole prequel to what we're studying today, you'll find out Jesus said Lazarus was actually sick. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, had sent word to his disciples and said, hey, could you ask the Lord to come? Lazarus is sick. It's bad. It's like sickness unto death. And what did Jesus do when he got word that, that the girls were calling from over there in Bethany? Come, come, come. Dad, you, you know, Jesus, you, you heal all sorts of sick people. This will be no trouble. Could you get over here? Hurry. What did Jesus do? He stayed put. He intentionally did not go running over to heal Lazarus. Finally, Lazarus dies, and they put him in the grave, and days begin to pass by, and Jesus finally says, hey, guys, we got to go over there. It's for your sake, I tell you, that we weren't there. It's for your sake, to his disciples, he told them, that we weren't there when Lazarus was sick. Why? He didn't want them to catch a cold? <laughs> he didn't want them to get sickness unto death? Well, why was it for their sake? You ever thought about that? He said those very words. It's for your sake that we were not there when he was sick. But now we go to him, for he sleeps. Sleeps. Ha <laughs> ha. That's, that's like their lingo for he's dead. We're going to go now. That now that he's dead, they're going like, what? Jesus, your timing is off. I'm sure some of them were thinking it. Put yourself in their shoes. You said, why? Where? Come on. You know how I know this? I cheated. I read. I'm not making up any of this. I'm just, I'm just paraphrasing for you. Because if you want, you can read it for yourself. Extra credit. Because in, in, earlier in this chapter, the girls are like, you know, well, and uh, it's even better brought out. Let me take you over to another, to another of the Gospels. They said in, sorry, I've got I've to flip, flip my pages here. The girls go, Jesus, if you would have been here, if you would have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. Sorry, it's back just in the, in another chapter, John 11. Martha, when she heard Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary, she stayed at the house. This is John 11, 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have had to die. You're good at taking care of sickness. He wouldn't have had to die. Why didn't you come? And even now, she says, I know whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. What's she inferring? Well, you did sickness. Maybe you can fix this even though it's too late. He's already dead. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again in the resurrection. She goes, Martha says to him, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? 
By the way, this is the million dollars spiritual question. How many of you believe in Jesus? Do you believe when you die that you will actually not die? The Bible teaches, Paul said, when you're absent from this body, you are now what? Present with the Lord. You're not going to be dead out in limbo. You're just going to upgrade from this earthly tent to a heavenly mansion made by God. That's what we have to look for. So Jesus is telling her this. Do you believe this? And she's like, well, yes, Lord. I believe that you're the son, of, the, the, the son of God. You're the Christ, even the one that comes into the world. And when she said this, she went away. And she called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher's here. He's calling for you. So when she hears it, she gets up, she runs out. And Jesus, it said, had not yet come into the village. But, but he was still in the place where Martha met him. And the Jews who were with Mary, they saw her run out. They were consoling her. They, they, they followed her, supposing she, she was going to go to the tomb, you know, like go grieving sister, go visit the grave. Therefore, when Mary came to Jesus, she saw him and fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She believed Jesus could heal sick. But what she didn't understand is Jesus doesn't just do sick. I've said this before. Jesus does dead. Dead, no problem. He can't just heal sicknesses. He can heal dead. You, th this is kind of a biggie. When some guys are like, why are you so big on Jesus? Because I studied a lot of other religions, and none of their leaders did dead. Even if they would pulled off a miracle, they made the that some sign happened in the heavens, or they made something happen in the... They never did dead, like Jesus did. And when Jesus saw her weeping, he, and the Jews that came also weeping, he was moved in his spirit, and he was troubled. He said, where'd you, where'd you lay him? They said, Lord, come and see. And the Jews were saying, look how much he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man couldn't he have kept this man from dying? Now this is our natural thinking coming out right here in the Bible. Couldn't this guy who healed that guy that was born blind, couldn't he do whatever cold or thing that killed Lazarus? Couldn't he have healed him? Sounds like total logic thinking, right? Except Jesus said just a little earlier, for your sakes we're not going now. And this sickness is not unto death. This sickness is unto glorifying God in heaven. I'm going to do something that you guys need to learn. What they needed to learn was he didn't just do sick. He did dead. They just didn't get it. And so we read here. So again, Jesus being deeply moved came to the tomb. It was a cave and there was a stone laying against it. He said, remove the stone. And Martha, the sister of the deceased, said, Lord, by this time there'll be a stench. He's been dead for four days. <laughs> like Jesus doesn't know what decomposing bodies are like, you know. So Jesus said, did I not say to you, if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? And so they removed the stone and he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, that they might believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, I love this part, he comes hopping out. He's still bound up, it says, with the, with the burial cloth. He's like a mummy wrapped up in the burial cloth. And he's come hopping out, and they, he, Jesus says, unbind him. Let him go. Give him something to drink. The guy's been dead for four days. He's a little, you know, dehydrated. And therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what had done believed in Jesus. But some went and told the Pharisees the things that he had done. And therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and said, What are we going to do? This man is performing so many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men are going to believe in him. All the Romans will come and take away our, both our place and our nation. We're going to lose our prestige if this guy keeps going the way he's going. One of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest, said, You know nothing at all, and nor did you take into account it is expedient for, for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. This is, 
And it says, he didn't say this on his own initiative, but being the high priest that year, he was prophesying that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not only for the nation, verse 52 says, but in order that he might also gather together into one children of God, all of those who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill Jesus. From what day? The day he rose Lazarus from the dead. They really didn't like this particular day. They didn't like the idea that he had power over death. This is like, now you're venturing into a whole new realm of signs here. I mean, doing sick, doing blind, doing lame, okay, 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 we can't stand it, everybody likes you already. Now you do dead, and they're like, everybody wants a piece of him. And, and they don't just want to go see him, they want to go see the guy who was dead. I hate to tell you this, but in Matthew's Gospel, they actually decided from that day forward that they plotted not just to kill Jesus. Do you know who else they wanted to take out? Lazarus. Lazarus. And in fact, it's repeated. Let me just show you in case you Bible students are wondering where I come up with these ideas. Look, just flip the page back to John 12 and look at verse 10. But the chief priests also planned to put who to death? Lazarus. Right there, you can highlight it. <laughs> Bummer for Lazarus. You've already been dead. You get raised from the dead, and now everybody wants to kill you. <laughs> Not everybody. The leaders, the religious muck and mucks, they want to kill you. Now, if you're Lazarus, you're probably going, go ahead, because Jesus just raised me again. <laughs> you already know. No, you've crossed over, been back. You know, like, hey, no, nothing to worry about. But I want to show you something that you might not have caught. Would you look at verse 16? I'd like to end with this this morning. Here, Jesus had told his disciples, this is for your sake that I wasn't there. You needed to learn that I could do something. That up to now, you only thought I could heal sickness. You didn't understand I had the power over death. See, this is where the difference of Jesus comes into play. His Godness, Emmanuel, God with us, is now being borne out. In the, in the spiritual realm, right before their eyes. When he raises a man from the dead, they're going, wait a minute, this is a whole other level of sign and wonder. But interesting to me, Jesus, it says here in John 12, 14, he found a donkey, sat on it, rode in, you know, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold your king comes, seated on the donkey's colt. And that's another thing that proved he was God, by the way. I only say this because I grew up spent some time on a farm and those of you that have ever tried to ride a donkey especially one who has never been broken that's what this is by the way a baby donkey no one's ever ridden on who volunteers for the first ride this is where I uh, if you have been around donkeys and you know how honorary they are you know that this is the worst day of the whole uh, seriously this is not the day you go you, and, and you don't throw a blanket over its back and just jump on Put a full weight of a grown man on. You you start with like light weights and a little bit at a time, and you you know because they buck and throw it and bite at it and rip it off. And but Jesus was the Son of God, God with us. He to me, and it gets better because as he's riding in, it says the people were shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in. Can you imagine a bunch of people screaming in front of a donkey that has never been ridden on? See, if you, know, if you don't put together things like, you, you're not putting yourself in the story good enough. If you've been on a farm, you know that if you go, and, and, and when it's time to break an animal, we call it breaking, you know, like a horse, breaking in a horse or a donkey, you, you don't, the guys around the corral are not yelling. What are they doing? There's quiet. There's a reason. You make too much noise, you, you spook the animal, and you put the guy that's out in the pen to, to risk. I mean, he's, gotta, he's already out there with a the wild animal trying to get onto it, and you don't need people swooping and hollering and screaming. It's, it's shh, shh. Jesus gets on the donkey no one's ever ridden on, right? And he's going into town, and there's a whole crowd. And what are they doing? They're not only yelling, oh, I left out one thing. It's Palm Sunday. What are they doing with the palm fronds and with their garments? They're throwing them down on the road in front of the donkey. 
do you think maybe it would like freak the donkey out a little? A baby donkey no one's ever ridden on? You want to see why I think Jesus was God? Just this whole story is miraculous that he could even get to town. Because that donkey would have just... Uh, except that the Son of God has sovereignty over all dominion of all animals, all mankind, everything. And that donkey went, I'm on a mission. He's the boss. And he doesn't buck him. He doesn't throw. He doesn't freak out when they're throwing palm branches in front of him. He just marches into Jerusalem. See, this whole day is a, is a marvelous day. And the crowds are there because... Not just for Jesus. They want to see Lazarus, who Jesus just rose from the dead. This guy is remarkable. Mastery over death. Mastery over the, of the living. Over the donkey. Over the whole situation. And Jesus is sitting there riding in. And listen to verse 16. Just in case you ever read a Bible verse and you're a little hard on yourself, you think, I don't get it. Let me show you how much his disciples understood what was going on. Look at verse 16 of John 12. These things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that he had done these things, they had done these things to him. They actually didn't get what was going on on the very first Palm Sunday. Well, literally, on the day it was happening in front of them. Miraculous day. Donkey acquired. Did they get that? That that was a miracle that they didn't chop off the hands of the guys that went to get it? Did they get it that the donkey just submitted and let Jesus ride on it with a garment thrown over it? And, and that it didn't buck him when they were throwing palm fronds down in front of him and their garments and yelling? No, they didn't get it. I just want you to know this. Because some of you are really hard on yourself. Call me, Pastor, I just don't understand. What is God doing in my life today? I just don't get it. Join the club. You're in good company. The apostles, the A-team, they didn't even get it. They were there with Jesus. Did not understand until what happened? Until Jesus was glorified. What, when was he glorified? We haven't got to that part of the story yet. You guys know it already, right? When was it? In Pentecost, right? Remember in Acts chapter 2 into 3 when Jesus is there with his disciples on the mount of and, 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 and there the angels, you know, it says the heavens open and they're parted. And he can see, they can see straight up into heaven. And Jesus has died already and been buried for three days and then he's risen and he showed himself alive for a period of over 40 days. Alive from the dead. And now is the day he ascends back to heaven. And his disciples are there, it says, and as he begins to just go up into the heavens, right before their eyes. By the way, I volunteer to go on any day back to see. I want that day. I don't know about you, but that's like on my number one list of... Who, would anyone go with me on that day to watch Jesus like leave the... He's already resurrected. I know it's easy in a glorified body, but I think that's extra perk. You know, you get to see him resurrected, and then you get to see him caught up and taken to heaven. Anyone volunteer for that day? We got the time dial, we'll set it in and go back. And, and you know what his disciples did that day? He said they went... <gasps> in, in Hebrew, their jaw was unhinged. The Greek is equivalent. They, they literally, their jaw just went... <clears throat> and the angels said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand around gawking, you know, with your jaw just hanging down like, <laughs> do you not know that this Jesus whom you have just seen go into heaven, right? What did he say? Will return in what? Like manner. The clouds had parted heaven. Is, see, we think heaven's so far away. I don't think it is. I think it's right over there. Amen. It's just that it's in a different dimension and we need God to pull back the clouds and see it. And he's going to return. And what does it say in Revelation? The clouds will part. Here he comes flying. Now, when he returns, he's in a robe, sash, written on his thigh, King of what? Kings, Lord of 
lords, and he'll come back. And all the saints that have died in faith, they get to come back with him. My daughter, who loves horses, Joy, she always used to be, Dad, is there going to be animals in heaven? Great question. What's the answer? Oh, yes, but they're upgraded. The horses can fly. I mean, come on, do kids ask that? Oh, Adam, you're a pastor, you know. Do they ask? Of course they ask that. Is there going to be animals in heaven? Listen, yes, there is, but they're, they're a little upgraded from the ones we have down here. I mean, don't sell it short, guys. Tell them what it really is. The horses are flying horses, and all the believers, maybe you have an auntie or a grandparent that died in faith before you, they're going to be coming back flying in on a horse. Yeehaw, man, this is... Uh, <laughs> If you happen to die before the rapture, it's not such a bad deal. Because you get the, the flying horse ride coming back. Flying behind Jesus, of course, who's got a sword that slays the bad guys and coming out of his... I mean, it's a good day. The second coming is going to be even cooler than the first. Okay? But it's all promised. And unless you... Don't worry if you don't get it all the first time. These guys were there that day and they didn't get it. They don't even perceive the whole Palm Sunday significance until the moment that Jesus was taken up before their eyes. That's when they remember, oh yeah, we did that. Oh yeah, there was a verse that said we were supposed to do that. I didn't even think about Psalm 118. I can just see the light going on. But ding Wow! That whole... um. Hosanna thing. Oh, yeah, that was an interesting day. We, there was a bunch of people wanting to see Lazarus. Everyone was pushing to see him. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill Jesus. Not very popular to be in the spiritual movement at the moment. But they do kill Jesus. And not until after he's resurrected from the dead and taken up did the light go on for that. Look, if you wouldn't mind, maybe you should highlight verse 16 in your Bible. These things they did not, the disciples, not the people, the, the followers of Jesus. See, some of you are followers of Jesus. You're his disciples, and you don't get some things, and you call me up, and you're all like, I don't get it. Quit being so hard on yourself. These guys didn't understand these things until they saw Jesus glorified. And by the way, I, I want to submit to you, until you actually perceive that Christ is resurrected and that he is now seated where the right hand remember he ascended and was seated at the right hand of the father until god allows that understanding to crystallize in you i believe a lot of the things of the scripture will be um befuddling to you you'll have a really hard time getting it it's like it's like there'll be a veil over your eyes because the the, the real illumination of all spiritual truth takes place when we see Christ for who he is and where he is seated. And until that, until that, it's like the spiritual key that unlocks the rest of the passages. It's the thing that takes away the blinders. You know, we sing that song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my, why? why? I want to see you. And to see the things of the Lord until he opens our eyes, our spiritual eyes. Remember, Jesus ended his sermons, let those that have ears to hear, let them what? Hear what the Spirit says. Those that have eyes. The prophet Isaiah, by the way, he didn't, we didn't make up this idea. The prophet Isaiah, he preached to Israel. He said, you guys have eyes, but you see not. You have ears, but you hear not. And he was talking not about physical sight, physical hearing of a song or something. It was the spiritual sight, the spiritual hearing. The Spirit speaks to you. But see, I believe that men don't really perceive his, his speaking or they don't see the things that his Spirit is, is illuminating in front of them until they come to recognize Jesus as the one that got seated at God's right hand. When you, when you get, when, when God like just opens your understanding that Christ didn't just come down here. Oh, yes, that's a great question. If God's real, why doesn't he come down here and show himself? He did. But he didn't just come down here and stay down here. He came down here, died for our sins, and returned to where he came from, the seat of power, the right hand of the Heavenly Father. 
and he will return again from that seat to those that are waiting and watching for him. He's coming back. Now this is Palm Sunday message on steroids. Okay? That's what it's really about. Is he came the first time, but but that's not the end of the story. I can't teach you this and that would be a disservice if I taught you. Yeah, and he came and he left and that's it. The end. No, he came, he left to go be back to the father, but he said, guys, don't let your heart be troubled. Remember John 14? In my father's house are many what? Mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. I will come again, he says, and receive you to myself. If anyone asks you, where did you come up with that idea Jesus is coming again? What's the answer? The correct answer, by the way. Jesus. You don't like it, don't get mad at me. Take it up with him. I'm sorry, some people get really mad at me when I tell them that the Lord's going to return. It makes them all uncomfortable. Oh no, I have to change the way I live. If he's really coming, I mean, i I got to quit sinning. Well, duh. It's a good idea. Okay? Get ready. Guys, do you, do you understand? They didn't understand the days or the times. They only knew... They did know the seasons, though. Herod even said, Don't you guys... Um, you know, when he... It disturbed him that he heard there was one they were calling born king of the Jews. Where, where's he going to be born? And he was able to ask the religious guys, Where's it say he'll be born? In Bethlehem. Oh, guys, go look for him so I could worship. Liar. That was Herod saying that. Were the religious guys able to figure out where the Messiah would be born? Sure. Did they have a sense that the Messiah was coming? Sure. Now they lived in the day that he appears and he makes his public appearance. Even his own disciples, though, they don't get it. On that very day, they're not getting that it's that day, that really significant Psalm 118 day of salvation. Behold, this is marvelous in the sight of the Lord. Salvation has come. I mean, did they get it? No. Not until they see Christ resurrected. Ascended to his place. When you see Christ in that position, all of a sudden a veil is pulled away from your eyes. Your understanding of the scriptures change. The whole story unfolds. You don't see Jesus just as a, a guy down there doing good works and giving good teachings and love your neighbor. Good, Yeah, he's got all these good moral things, he says. And he's, a, he's, a, and he's a healer. He's a good teacher, a good healer. I've heard people. How many of you heard people say that about Jesus? Oh, yeah, I believe he was a good healer. He was a good teacher. No, man, he wasn't just a good healer and a good teacher. He was the son of God. He was God with us. Emmanuel came down here so he could die for our sins. He was God's festival sacrifice bound to the horns of the altar. To be slain, he was put on that cross so my sin would be forgiven. The Lamb had come. And now the Lamb, when he returns, it won't be in reference to sin. It'll be in power. I look forward to that day. I mean, I'm excited. I've been waiting for this day 40 years ago I was being taught as a young Christian, this could happen any minute. And let me tell you, 1979, I remember Pastor Chuck Smith saying, I don't know if we're going to make it till 1980. Israel's a nation again. All these different scriptural prophecies are being fulfilled right before our eyes. It could happen any minute. And there was an anticipation of, oh man, it could be any second. Tell your family, tell your friends. You could go, honestly, you couldn't go anywhere without someone talking about Jesus. The bank, the post office, the 7-Eleven the, the on the corner, you know, the, the, the little mini mart type store. There, everyone's like talking something about Jesus. It's like Jesus was a buzz. And now today people are like, eh, they said he was coming a while ago. He hasn't come. He's probably never going to come. Yeah, that's, you know. By the way, that thinking is very flawed. That's like saying you're watching a ball game and it's been going on for hours. It's never going to end. That, maybe the ladies feel like that when they walk in the room and the guys. But, but you know, when the two-minute the two minute, uh, clock has, you know, gone on, the guys are like, no, man, there's only two minutes left. Except with commercials and timeouts and everything. Be, you know, fouls, maybe another half an hour, they'll stretch it out. But that two minutes is a real exciting two minutes, right? Because you're coming down to the end of the game. Now, if you walk in and you tell me, it's never going to end, and, and I'm looking at the clock there, and it says two minutes left. 
I got news for you. You are errant in your thinking because we're only two minutes out from the end of the game. And if I was close to the Lord's coming 40 years ago when I accepted Christ, how close am I now? I mean, I've already seen a couple of minutes tick off the clock. Not just a couple of minutes, a couple of years. A couple of decades. Four of them to be exact. I am four decades closer to the return of the Lord than on the day I first believed. I'm excited, man. If I thought it was close back then, I know it is close now. And I look around at what's going on in the world and I think, oh, Lord, we are getting... I mean, it's, guys ask me, so is there anything else that has to happen in the Bible before the return of the Lord, like any prophecies you know about? And That's a great question, by the way. I'm like, I'm pretty sure we got all the boxes checked. I know some guys will argue this one or that one. You know what? I don't think we know all the stuff. But I think we have enough to see the signs of the times. And Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. You know the signs of the times. And when you see the signs of the times come to pass, what are you supposed to do? Look up. Your redemption draws nigh. We should be looking up, man. This should be a day we just celebrate. Man, let's look up. Because the Lord could be coming any minute. He came once. He can come again. And it could be any minute. And it's clouds. Look behind you there. On the mountain, there's clouds. The ones, oh, there's some over there and over there. There's a lot over there. You might just, you know, show up today. It would be nice if, I always joke, wouldn't it be nice if we came right now? We don't even have to put this stuff away. <laughs> you guys wouldn't be able to stand me in heaven. I'd be like, I told you. Didn't I tell you to get ready? And, uh, we didn't know. I think we to spare you. My, 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 no, I still got, my excitement, I'd be like, eh. I'd probably be not one, the only pastor doing it, though. Hopefully there'd be a whole bunch of other brothers and sisters in Christ going, I was telling you, you know, wasn't I telling you to get ready? The Lord's coming. I mean, we should not fall asleep as a church. As the day approaches, it, it, there's a great stern warning in Matthew, right? To not be dressed in readiness. Do not sleep. Don't slump. Don't fall into a spiritual apathy. Well, it's been a long time. He's probably not coming. I'll take a nap. No, it's been a long time and we're counting down the last few ticks off the clock. Wake up. Wake up and be ready. I don't want anyone left behind. I, I hope everyone I have the privilege to, to stir up their faith, I get to like stir them into that, to that readiness. They're, they're going, yeah, let's do it. Let's be ready for the Lord's coming. Because that's what, He is coming. I'm telling you, He is coming. He came once. That, this is the part that's so so to me, so crystal clear, he didn't do all that just to say, well, I go to prepare a place, but I'm not coming back. Jesus is the one who said he'd be back. And he said he'd be back for us. So that where he is, we get to be also. Anyone excited about going to be with the Lord? Getting a new body, no more pain. Our dear sister Sharon, our pancake lady, she's in pain. She wasn't here with us this morning. We should close with prayer for her. And, and the, the, she's not the only one. There's others. Ginger. We should be praying. You know, we, we got these ones that are hurting. L would you join me? Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we, we do indeed pray for our brothers and sisters right now. Ginger and Auntie Sharon, the, our pancake lady, Lord, we thank you for her. And we pray now that your Holy Ghost would go to them, bring comfort to their bodies, bring comfort to their soul, Lord. Peace to their spirit. I pray for our, uh, the gal that we met years ago on the ship the, that got in the car accident and broke her femur and her pelvis and her punctured her lungs and, or I mean, her innards and uh, with her ribs broken and her collarbone and really hurting, Lord. Kimmy, Auntie Kimmy, I pray for her. You just give comfort to her body and to her mind. She says she can't remember things now. It's like her, it's affected her uh, short-term memory, Lord. I think all of us have troubles, Lord. We just come before you. We ask that you would doctor us up. Give us strength to our bodies, to our minds, to our souls as we get ready to celebrate the, the greatest celebration of, of the whole year to me, Lord, next week. The celebration of your resurrection. Resurrection Sunday next week, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. Thank you for dying for us as we'll celebrate that this week on Good Friday. And even more, thank you for rising from the dead as we celebrate that next week. Help bring those 
out next week that need to hear that powerful resurrection message to strengthen their faith. I pray you would begin a work even now in our relatives, in our friends, our co-workers, that we'd be able to invite them to church next week. I know they let down their guard a little at this time of year. And Christmas and Easter, Lord, they seem to, to, to be a little more willing to go to church. So I pray we would be able to help get those folks out that need their faith strengthened this week. Lord, set divine appointments for all of us as we go into this week. I ask it in Jesus, your precious Son's name. In His name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song. And Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.